Good morning, everyone. To prepare for our brief meditation reflection, I ask you to join me in a simple, short prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Please repeat me these simple words. Come, Holy Spirit. Fill my mind with light. Fill my heart with pure love. Come, Holy Spirit. Amen. The Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. My friends, what a beautiful day for all of us from the Diocese of Arlington. What a beautiful event to conclude our 50th anniversary Jubilee year. We all thank Bishop Burbit for leading us as a shepherd to this festive holy day, 50 years as a diocesan family, 50 years as a diocesan church. As you know, three years led us here, year one of preparation, remembrance, and the Blessed Eucharist, year two, the year of rejoicing with Mary, year three, the year of renewal with a special focus on the new evangelization, three years bringing us to one day, one holy day, a day of pilgrimage. And we all know what a pilgrimage is. It's a journey to a holy place, a journey to this holy place, the shrine of the National Basilica of the Immaculate Conception, what we affectionately love to call America's Catholic Church. And so here in America's Catholic Church, we assemble as pilgrims from over 70 parishes and missions that compose our blessed diocese. My friends, in this holy place, there is so much to engage the eyes. This place is a feast for the eyes. When you come in, you're immediately drawn up. There is so much for the eye to take in. And so with so much to look at and to pray with, I ask you to fix your eyes today on just one detail of this magnificent structure. There is one detail that you'll find in absolutely everywhere in this basilica. There's one detail you'll find in every loggia, and every transept, and every doorway, and every side chapel, over nearly every saint. I speak of the arches. Arches are everywhere in this basilica. You see above the grand arches in the nave of this church, arches over the transepts left and right, arches along the body of the nave to either side of you, arches over the niches where the saints are contained. Everywhere you look, arches and arches and more arches. Everywhere and why? Why so many? Are these just ornamental? Are they just aesthetic, pleasing to the eye? Are they here just because they're beautiful? Or could there be much more to it? Allow me to read to you this explanation from a Catholic architect. During the Roman Republic, generals built triumphal arches all over the city to commemorate their military victories. When they returned to Rome from a military campaign, their procession would follow a route which passed through all of these arches, including whichever triumphal arches previously honored them. This procession through multiple arches signified not only their recent victory, but a remembrance of all their victories. The most recognized triumphal arch in the world, he says, is the Arch of Constantine. And how fitting, because it was the Emperor Constantine who famously legalized Christianity after his own conversion to the Catholic faith. The Arch of Constantine led, he says, to the triumphal arches being incorporated into the design of church basilicas to signify the victory of Jesus, the victory of Jesus over sin, suffering, and death. My, oh my, these arches speak. These arches, my friends, are not just decorative, not just beautiful. They are victory of Jesus arches. 
Every single one of them speaks of victory. My friends, personally speaking, you and I are here today because of all the victories that Jesus has won in our lives. Think of your own life today. Think of the significant events in your life, the good and the bad the storms, the trials, the failings, the disappointments, the sins, the losses, and you're still here. You're here as a persevering pilgrim in the battle of life. In quiet reflection, you can call to mind so many victories, so many times that Jesus has come through for you, so many times Jesus has saved you, that he has forgiven you, that he has renewed you, that he has recommissioned you as his missionary disciples in this broken world. My friends, as difficult, basically impossible, as it would be to try to count all the arches in this basilica, I declare to you today that it would be even more difficult to count all the victories that Jesus Christ has won for you, that he has won in you, that he has won through you. And so as you walk about this basilica today, as you literally walk through and under arches of victory, pray with them. Pray with gratitude to the Lord for all he has personally done for you. Thank you, Jesus, for Fill in the blank. We can all fill in the blank over and over again. So many specific graces to be grateful for today. And certainly we begin by thanking the Lord for our diocese. We don't boast in any prideful way about it, but there's no dispute the tremendous blessing that it is for clergy, for religious, for lay faithful to call the Diocese of Arlington our home. We give thanks to God for the victories in parishes, the grace of God at work in your own parish, the grace of God at work in your role in the parish. Innumerable arches, my friends, innumerable victories, limitless gratitude marks this day for us. We all like to win, right? We're all naturally competitive. We all like to win. Before I entered the seminary, I had the great privilege of being a soccer coach. I coached for three years the JV boys soccer team at one of our Catholic high schools here in the diocese. And you know, coaches say a lot of things, right? They shout a lot of instructions during the practices and during the games. But over time, I started to realize there were two words that had the most impact as a coach. There were two words that consistently made the difference. And those two words were, Eyes up. Eyes up. I would see a player dribble the ball during the, during the game, very talented guy, but his eyes were down. And I would yell out, Brad, eyes up. He would see the open player and make a brilliant pass. Another play, James, eyes up. He didn't see it. The goal was open. Eyes up. He scores the goal. He just needed to see that it was there. My friends, that's exactly what faith does for us. It shifts our eyes, it lifts our eyes up. And when you lift your eyes up here, staring back at you, almost glaring back at you, through the arches is battle-worn Jesus wounded, victorious, warrior Jesus. That Jesus on the back wall is a a serious savior. That's a warrior Jesus, a Jesus who fights, a Jesus who fights literally to the death for us, who waged spiritual war in order to gain for us eternal victory with eternal spoils. First John chapter five, who is the victor over the world? the one who believes. The one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God, 
the victory that conquers the world is our faith. Revelation chapter 21, I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, God's dwelling is with the human race. He will dwell with them and they will be His people. He will wipe every tear from their eyes and there shall be no more death or mourning, wailing or pain, for the old order has passed away. The one who sat on the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. The one who sits on the throne of victory says to us, I make all things new. Well, my friends, that one who sits on the throne first had to stretch out his arms on the cross for us. The one who sits on the throne first had to nail our sins to the cross in his own body. The one who sits on the throne first had to pay a debt he didn't owe because we all owed a debt we couldn't pay. My friends, the debt is paid. He reigns victorious. This whole building, this whole day, this whole diocese proclaims it. The strife is o'er, the battle done, the victory of life is won. Alleluia. My friends, we have no doubt the victory is won. The Lamb of God is seated on His throne. Death no longer has power over Him because of Him, because of what He did. His victory is now ours for the taking. By faith, it's ours. St. John said it, the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God is the victor. And so for all of us here today, victory in our life, the greatest victory in our life is that we believe that we are believers, that we are disciples. By faith, you are a pre-resurrected man. By faith, you are a pre-resurrected woman. By faith, death no longer has power over him, over you, over me. It is finished victory. But I ask you, is this victory only ours for the taking? Is this victory of Jesus Christ only for us? We all know the answer, but do we know the terrain? Do we know the terrain of the current battlefield, the battlefield for souls? I cannot but speak today of a small book that so many are reading. It's a short book about today's battlefield, and it begins with a quote from the year 1974. Fifty years ago today, 1974, the year that our blessed diocese was founded. This small book begins with a quote from the venerable Fulton Sheen. Listen to these words from Bishop Fulton Sheen. We are at the end of Christendom, not of Christianity, not of the church, but of Christendom. Now what is meant by Christendom, he says, Christendom is economic, political, social life as inspired by Christian principles. That is ending, we've seen it die. Wow. 1974, 50 years ago, the words of Bishop Sheen. Pope St. John Paul II, when he closed the Jubilee year 2000, said this, even in countries evangelized many centuries ago, the reality of a Christian society is now gone. Wow. The end of Christendom, the reality of Christian society gone. This small book entitled from Christendom to Apostolic Mission by Monsignor James Shea, From Christendom to Apostolic Mission, a book that we must all read because we must know the terrain. My friends, the victory of Jesus gives us confidence. It gives us hope in all circumstances, but hope isn't blind. Hope doesn't put blinders on. We know we need to know the terrain. And it doesn't take too much effort to look around and survey and recognize that there are so many who do not know Jesus. There are so many who do not know the joy of Christian faith. There are so many who simply do not know joy. So many who do not know what it's like 
to experience the personal forgiveness of God. One of my favorite stories of the personal forgiveness of God kind of victory, I think it's one we can all relate to. Children's stories always relate to all of us. My first assignment many years ago and hearing kids' confessions and a boy came in. He decided to go face to face. He's not intimidated or afraid of the priest, so he does his, his part. And then at the end, I raise my right hand to pronounce the prayer of absolution. And I had my eyes closed as I did this. God, the Father of mercies, through the death and resurrection of his Son, and I absolve you from your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. I had my eyes closed and then I just felt this. A high five is a victory gesture, right? I'm forgiven, I'm free. Yeah, thank you, Father. High five. Every confession's a victory. My friends, tell people about this. Tell people about the joy of confession. Tell them how amazing it is to experience the peace that only God can give. This treasure of confession, this treasure of our church can't hide under a bushel basket. When you have the chance, very naturally in conversation, share this good news. What a blessing to be a Catholic. What a blessing to be able to go to confession. My friends, the victory of God's mercy is not only ours for the taking. It is ours to communicate. It is ours to proclaim. Imagine the joy of leading a family member back to the sacrament of confession. Imagine the joy of leading a friend into the Catholic Church as a convert for him or her to experience for the first time, hearing the words, your sins are forgiven, go in peace. And imagine the joy of God, Almighty God, seeing all this from above. He loved every soul into being, and he aches for the reconciliation and healing of every one of his people, and the task is ours. The victory of faith is not only ours for the taking, it is ours for the paying forward. And so pay it forward with grateful enthusiasm. My friends, the doors of this magnificent basilica, these doors did not merely open today to let us in. The doors at the end of this Jubilee Festival will open to let you out, to let you out into a mission field. So many hurting in the mission field who need you to witness. The doors of this basilica, the doors of the parish, the doors of your home, all these doors open out into the mission field, and the missionary is you. The missionary is you. My friends, this Jubilee Day of pilgrimage is, yes, about giving thanks to God for all of his victories in our life in our life of parishes, in our life as a diocese. But as we look and pray with the triumphal arches, we also know this, that today is also about going forth from this holy place as emissaries of the victorious one, as ambassadors of God's mercy, as disciples of the one who makes all things new through you. He wants to make all things new through you. Say yes. Say yes to your call to bring more souls to him who sits on the throne. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, we worship and adore you. We praise and thank you. You are our God and Redeemer as a diocesan family today. We give you thanks for the countless blessings you have bestowed upon us. We choose not to hoard those blessings or to hide those blessings. Send us as your instruments in this broken world. Send us to the souls who hunger for your amazing, reckless love. Blessed Mother, St. Thomas More, St. Elizabeth Ann Seton, and St. Faustina, 
pray for us.